Come on. Let me see. Bring you out your Bibles, your phones, whatever you're going to read God's Word with today. Come on, but, uh, good morning. Come on, bro. Uh, good to see you guys. Good yeah. to be with you guys. Good to see you, uh, you've been an amazing service so far. So uh, it's so awesome to see Julia up here and Christiana up here. Yes. yes. Just sharing your hearts with us. You know, I've never stood up and clapped for a welcome before. Yeah. For real. <laughs> But uh, Julia, it was awesome to see uh, to see you give your heart and cream and do a great job too. <laughs> but she's still <laughs> the show. Uh, she killed it. And uh, Christiana, thank you so much for sharing your heart. Yeah. Where, where you go? Where are you at? Come on. Uh, thank you so much for the community. Uh, Let's go. Uh, you know, your testimony uh, and help us to better understand the cross. And uh, of course, Terrence, thank you for the contribution, reminding us the heart to give. Let's go, bro. Just a couple of announcements before we get into the lesson here. Uh, on Tuesday morning, Julie and I will be heading out of town. Uh, we're he heading to St. Louis uh, and then Kansas City uh, for a tour of strengthening and encouragement as we oversee the churches uh, both in, in both of those uh, states and cities. And then while we're gone, though, uh, you guys will be in good hands because I'm going to leave uh, the church in Terrence's hands. Let's go, bro. All right, guys, turn to Matthew chapter 5. Come on, bro. And we'll read the scripture as we prepare to get into uh, our main text today, which will be in Philippians chapter 2. Come on, bro. Matthew chapter 5. You know, last night I, uh, I went out and I was praying. Uh, the girls kind of uh, descended upon our, our home and they were watching Top Gun last night. And I was like, you know, I'm going to go outside. I'm going to spend some time in prayer. And, uh, you know, about 10 o'clock last night, as I was out praying, um, as all the street lights came on, it was getting dark and all the street lights came on. There's something that I something that I noticed about the street lights in my neighborhood. Some of them were bright and strong. Uh, you could easily see your way. Uh, they illuminated a great path for you as you walked through the darkness. But others would, would flicker in and out. They'd be on for a minute, and then they would shut down. And you couldn't rely on them. Um, to create a, 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 path, a reliable path for you. They would flicker in and out and they were struggling. <laughs> and then there were others that were just completely out. Oh completely out. There was no, no light at all and they lit up nothing around them. <laughs> they were just a shell of a lampstand. Oh. Kind of a silhouette of a lampstand. Something that once did shine. As they just kind of stood there in the darkness. Amen. With that illustration in your mind, let's read Matthew chapter 5. Come on, bro. Come on, bro. And verse 14. The Bible says, you are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they, they put it on its stand. And it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. You know, the Bible says here to us as, as his disciples, he says, you are the light of the world. In this dark world, if there's ever going to be anyone that stands out, and lights the path, it will be my disciples. And it says here, you are like a city that's, that's built on a hill that, that cannot be hidden. A city whose light is clearly visible. You, know, you ever taken a, a plane uh, a plane ride at night? Yep. And you look down, and it, it's complete darkness, but all you can see is islands of light. Come on. Which are the cities that you, that you pass by. Come on. Cutting through the darkness. He says here that you are like that. You are a city, an island of light, a city on a hill that cannot be hidden. He says, do not put your light under a bowl and hide it or conceal it. You know, sometimes, uh, you know, my kids, when they were younger, they would read at night and they'd take a blanket and put over their, their head in the bedroom and they'd use a flashlight <laughs> to read. And only they could enjoy the light. Come on. Dude. He says, don't put your light under something and conceal it. And the main point of this parable is that 
Light is to be revealed, not concealed. Mm. So how's your shine this morning? Amen. Are you burning bright, illuminating the path, illuminating everyone around you? Or are you flickering in and out? Moments of shine and then moments of darkness. Wow. Or are there no light? Oops. Yeah. And you need to be turned on. You need to be burning brightly and you need to relight and reignite the flame Come within you. But that might turn to Philippians chapter two. The title of my lesson today is A Light to the World. Nice. And I only have two points for you. Point number one, stand out. Mm. Point number two, hold out. Mm. Wow. The book of Philippians was written by the Apostle Paul. In the year 62, just a couple of years before he died, in 64, and he wrote to the church of Philippi from a Roman prison. And he talked about how his chains had actually served to advance the gospel in Philippians chapter 1, verse 12. And then in chapter 2, he calls us to imitate the humility of Jesus Christ, and in that humility to lay down our lives for each other and for the world and to live selfless lives. And then he teaches us that as disciples, we are meant to stand out, that we are meant to shine. And that brings us to Philippians chapter 2, verse 12. My first point, stand out. Come on, bro. How do you do that? Tell us, bro. Verse 12. <laughs> Glad you asked. In verse 12, the Bible says, Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more. In my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fill, fulfill his good purpose. Do everything without crumbling or arguing. He actually says everything. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Does that really mean everything? <laughs> Do everything without grumbling or arguing so that you may become blameless and pure children of God without fault in a warped and crooked generation. Then you will shine. Then you will shine among them like stars in the sky as you hold firmly to the word of life. I love how the Amplified Bible says it. You will shine among them like stars in the sky, holding out and offering to everyone the word of life. You know, Paul, he says here, he calls us to, to number one, that you've got to work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. I mean, it's not Psalmist's job to keep you faithful. Wait, what? Are you out? It's not, it's not Julie's job to keep you faithful. It's not Terrence. You know, Terrence is pretty awesome. He's super awesome. You can't have faith for you. He says you got to work it out for yourself. you got to be a disciple yourself. you got to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. And he says you got to keep shining. you got to work that out. Because we live in a dark world. He describes it as warped. And crooked. He says, This is the audience that you need to preach to. This is the environment that you need to shine in a dark, crooked, warped, and some translations say perverse world. Wow. And this was written 2,000 years ago. Okay. Whereas, if you could go back in time and just walk around the culture of the day, you would think, Oh, this is pretty good. Yeah. It's way worse today. I, I would say, and I'm sure you would agree with me, that here 2,000 years later, the world has grown increasingly crooked. Yeah. Increasingly warped. Come on, bro. And pervert. In America, just some statistics for you, there is a murder. Just in America, not the world, but in America, there is a murder every 30 minutes. Wow. So, in, in just our service today, three people will be murdered. Wow. wow. There's a rape every three minutes. An aggravated assault every 30 seconds. Every 30 minutes in America, a new pornographic film is made. Recently, we are brutally reminded that even in our 
elementary schools, our children are not safe. In Uvalde, Texas, a couple of weeks ago, 20 children were shot in the classroom. There has been, in fact, 27 school shootings this year. And what I listen to you is, is some of the extremes, what we, what we see, what the media tells us, and what we know about, but it's far worse and more crooked than even that. You take a look at the, the relationships in America today between people, you just turn on the TV. Look at media today, it's so depressing. And it becomes pretty evident very quickly how divided we are in so many ways. And the Bible says here that we are to shine in this dark world. And he says here, do everything without grumbling, complaining, or arguing. You want to think about arguing and grumbling for a minute. Not really. Think about America. How much, I mean, just, I mean, Sorry. seriously, you turn, the, you turn the TV on. You watch any news channel today. And you see how the world is just full of complaint, yeah. full of grumbling. This word crooked, it means to be bent and twisted up. And he says, this is the environment that I want you to shine in. Because stars shine the brightest in the darkest of skies. Wow. It's why it's sometimes it's hard to see the stars in the sky when you're in the city. Because of a phenomenon called light pollution. Wow. But when you get away from the cities and you go to the mountains, you go out into the country, you look up into the sky. That's why I love living in Colorado. You go up to the mountains and you look up in the sky. And even where I grew up in Oregon as a young kid, the, the, the sky was just full of stars, super bright because the sky appeared so dark. It doesn't change. But when you're in a city, you don't see it. He says, that's how you're supposed to shine, like stars in the sky. And live your life, number one, how you shine is don't complain, don't grumble, and don't argue. Live as opposite of the world. He says, be blameless, be pure. In a perverse and impure world, he says, you will stand out. You will shine when you strive for purity. Come on, bro. And to be blameless and to be righteous. You know, you think about complaining and grumbling and arguing, think about who you are at work sometimes. Oh, <laughs> Think about who am I at school? Mm. Who am I when I'm driving down the road in traffic? <laughs> <laughs> and you think about, okay, how much complaining and grumbling and murmuring can come out of our mouths? Road rage! Yep. How easily way. sometimes when we're not doing well spiritually, we just get ticked off. Yep. Yeah. But we got the bumper sticker on the back says, I love Jesus. WWJD, what would Jesus do? And let me tell you, you know, having the bumper sticker, the, the, all that stuff, the little silver fish, being part of a Christian club or part of a campus ministry, that doesn't make you a light. <laughs> Acting the opposite of the world is what makes you a light. Oh, that's a great example of this. Being a light in a dark situation, look at Philippians chapter 1, verse 12. Paul has already mentioned he's in prison when he writes this. You think if, if there's anything that you can complain about, it's being wrongfully flogged and thrown into prison. And yet here he is in prison. He says, now I want you to know, brothers and sisters, verse 12, what has happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel. As a result, it, it has become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I am in chains for Christ. And because of my chains, most of the brothers and sisters have become confident in the Lord and dare all the more to proclaim the gospel without fear. You know, Paul's, his, his mindset, his perspective, his take was, you know, what has happened to me and what had happened to him is he was, he was flogged and he was thrown into prison. Many times, actually. He says, what has happened to me is actually advance the gospel. Wow. My unfortunate fortunate situation has really advanced God's word. Because Paul didn't see obstacles. He saw opportunities. He's in prison. And it says he was preaching to the palace guard. Now, if you know history, eventually, the, the gospel worked its way into the palace. Eventually, emperors became Christians. Well, how did that happen? 
Because Paul's in chains, sometimes chained to a Roman soldier, and he preached the word. Wow. He didn't complain. Wow. And he didn't argue. He's like, you know what? I'm here for a reason. So he, I don't have I can't go out and share my faith. So I'm gonna preach to this palace guard right now. Wow. And he would convert these guys. He actually converted a jailer in the city of Philippi, the Philippian jailer. He says, actually, because of my situation, I'm reaching people that I never would have reached. Wow. Is that your perspective when you go through hard stuff yeah. and difficulty? Go to Acts chapter 16 for a minute. Come on, bro. We're going to actually look at the moment where Paul is actually preaching to the jailer in Philippi. In Acts 16, verse 22. So Paul has been arrested. He's, he's thrown in jail. And here's how he shined brightly, him and Silas, in the midst of a very, very dark situation. Come on, bro. Acts 16, 22. It says the crowds joined in the attack against Paul and Silas, and the magistrates ordered them to be stripped and beaten with rods. I'd be complaining. Yeah. <laughs> but after they'd been severely flogged, they were thrown into prison, and the jailer was commanded to guard them carefully. When he received these orders, he put them in the inner cell, and he fastened their feet in the stocks. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying. And singing hymns to God. And the other prisoners were listening to them. I can think of a lot of things I would be doing in prison if I was wrongfully beat up and thrown there that wouldn't equate with singing hymns. <laughs> you'd, think, yeah, you'd be tempted to be bitter. You'd be tempted to be upset. You'd be tempted to complain. This is wrong. I've been wrongfully treated. But Paul's like, hey, silence sing a hymn. Can you lead us in song today? Wow. And it says that they're singing, and it says that everybody was listening to them. Wow. It, it says all the other prisoners, and even the jailer, I'm sure, was listening and asking themselves, how come they're so happy? <laughs> how come they're not complaining right now? Why do they have so much hope? And why are they so faithful? And then, of course, an earthquake happens. <laughs> And they convert the, the Philippian jailer and his whole family. Yeah. Is baptized that night. And the point is that the world is always watching. Yeah. The world is always listening. The world is always watching your life, not so much what you say. Paul went through more persecution, more unfortunate events and circumstances than, than anyone. And I never see in scripture where Paul loses it. <laughs> Where he complains, where he argues. Paul is literally a light in every situation. You know, there's this guy driving, and uh, he stops at a red light, and there's a woman behind him. And he stops at a red light, and, you know, he's just kind of waiting there, and he, he looks down, and the woman behind him is watching, waiting for the light to turn green. Eventually, it turns green, and his car doesn't move. It doesn't move at all. And he, she's like, what is he doing? And she honks the horn. His head's down like maybe he's looking at his phone or something. And she honks again. Finally, he looks up as the light turns yellow. And it's about to turn red. So he zooms through the intersection and leaves her hanging. You ever had that happen to you? Yeah. And so she has to go through a whole other red light cycle. And she's all mad and she's angry and she's yelling at him. She's giving him hand gestures. I'm not going to go any further than that. And she's cursing at him. She's fuming. And she's so angry at this. She calms down for a minute and she looks to her left, and the police officer standing at her left, and his gun is out, pointed at her, pulls her out of the car, handcuffs her, put, puts her in the patrol car. And after a, a, you know, a few moments, they, they clear things up, and he comes back to, and he says to her, You know, I'm sorry for the misunderstanding. But as I was listening to the words you were saying and watching the gestures that you were making, watching you curse, rant, and rave, and then I also noticed the, the what would Jesus do sign on the back of your car, the chrome fish, and the follow me to Sunday school license plate holder on the back of your car. I naturally assumed that somebody stole your car. <laughs> the world is always watching. And you got to stand out, not look or conform to the pattern of the world, but to stand out. Can, 
Somebody follow you around and without you, without you ever saying a word, would they know that you're a disciple of Jesus Christ? Wow. Because you stand out and you shine so bright. Wow. In this dark world. Come on, bro. My second point is you got to hold out. In Philippians chapter 2, verse 15, in the amplified version, go back to Philippians chapter 2. You got to hold out. In verse 15, the Bible says, so that you may prove yourselves to be blameless and guileless. It's a good word. Innocent and uncontaminated. And James, the Bible talks about keeping ourselves from being polluted by the world. Amen. Children of God without blemish in the midst of a morally crooked and spiritually perverted generation. Among whom you are seen as, as bright light beacons shining out clearly in the world of darkness. Holding out and offering to everyone the word of life. So that in the day of Christ, I will have reason to rejoice greatly because I did not run my race in vain or labor without result. You know, we shine, as we talked about point number one, by standing out, by being the opposite of the world. But secondly, you have to hold out. And this passage says in the Amplified that we hold out the word of life. So it's not enough to just, to just stand out. You actually have to tell someone yeah. mm. about the hope that you profess. Mm. In Matthew 5, he says, share the light with everyone. People sometimes say, well, I'll just let my actions be. I won't say nothing. I won't bother anybody. Well, it, it's good that you have great actions, but you have to, have to speak and share your faith and hold out the word of life. He says it's the word of life. The word of God is, is powerful. Come on, bro. The word of God has the power to change a life. In and of ourselves, we can't change anybody. Right. Not very many people would follow us if we weren't Christians. True. <laughs> but the word of God has the power to change anyone's life. It has the power to humble the most prideful person. <laughs> I have never met to this day a man or woman that God can help. I bet. I've seen the word of God heal the most hurting. The word of God has the power to disturb the comfortable yeah, sure. and comfort the disturbed. Yeah. Go to Hebrews chapter 4. Come on, bro. Come on, bro. Come on, bro. Yeah. The awesome, word of God is bro. powerful. What you have in your lap, what you hold in your hands, is the most powerful thing you will ever own. In Hebrews chapter 4, the Bible says, in verse 12, everybody there? Yep. It says the word of God is alive. He says, hold out the word of life, right? Here it says the word of God is alive. The word of God is active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to the dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and the attitudes of the heart. There's no escape. I mean, people don't know your thoughts. People don't know your attitudes. We can hide that from people. We can smile there. But God's like, uh, 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 I see everything. Wow. He says, nothing, verse 13, nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give account. You know, as we study the Bible, people, we've really got to trust this scripture. Let, let God's word do the work as we hold out the word of life. As we preach, as we teach, as we study the Bible with people, it's the word of God that does the work. It's not your fancy words or even your great insights. Come on, bro. Those are great, but it's not what does the work. Right. It's God's word that does the work because God knows what a person needs to hear. Wow. Because he knows what's going on. You know, we had an awesome campus devotional on Friday. That's all of our campus students. <laughs> I need to put the young guys in charge of preparing and planning and putting together the fun events for the devotionals because 
That's just not my strength anymore. <laughs> so I, I humbly, I humbly give it over to you. But they came up with a great, a great theme to preach about. They preach about faith, hope, and love. Nice. Daniel and Lennox preached on Daniel and Lennox preached on faith. Terrence and Adriana preached on hope. So did. And Will and Zalma preached on the greatest of these. Ooh, love, love. Yeah. Faith, hope, and love. And you know, it was incredible. I heard so many. So many great things about the devotional. So many great things about the lessons. So many people were impacted by the lessons. And then Addie was, she came back and she was sharing with me about the different lessons as they preached on hope. And she said, you know, I was so surprised. So many of the brothers came up to me after my, our lesson on hope and shared with me how impacted they were by the topic of hope. Even somebody that was visiting came up and said to me, you know, I just have to talk with you because what you said really connected with me in such a great way. Addie had no idea that she would impact so many people. She had no idea who needed to hear about hope. But God did. And God worked powerfully. Even I heard about some brothers, they were so impacted, they went home and they went out and they had to pray. They prayed till two in the morning. And they were so convicted. I think you talked about dating or something like that. Some brothers just have to pray for a long time. Come on, brother. Let's go, brother. Don't ask. But how does that happen? Well, because the scriptures say that the word of God it's it's living and active. It's it's not a dead book. It's not something that's supposed to get dusty and just sit on your on, on the corner of your desk or on the counter. It's something that's alive. And when you read it, it's going to speak to you and specifically speak to your attitude and heart and where you at, where you are at. And it's either going to disturb you if you're comfortable or it comforts you when you're disturbed. Wow. Wow. The Bible says of itself, it's compared to a mirror. Mm. As you look at God's word, you will more clearly see yourself. You will see God, but you'll see yourself. Because as you read the Bible, the Bible reads you. Yeah. Oh. Go to Isaiah chapter 5. Come on, bro. As you read the Bible, the Bible reads you. Wow. I heard somebody say, wait, don't hear that. <laughs> Isaiah 55 in verse 10. In the middle of verse 10, one of my favorite scriptures about the word of God and how powerful it is. As the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return to it without watering the earth and making it bud and flourish so that it yields seed for the sower and bread for the eater, so is my word that goes out from my mouth. It will not return to me empty. It will accomplish what I desire, and it will achieve the purpose for which I sent it. Wow. Now, this is something you really need to understand about God's word. That God always speaks exactly, always knows exactly what to say. He always knows exactly what someone needs to hear. And he says that, as the, my word goes out, and sometimes we're in a Bible study and we don't know, man, is this, is this getting to the heart? Are they, are they getting the message? You just got to trust God is working. There may be no expression on their face at all. And God's like, it's okay. Yeah. A seed is being planted. Right. And it's fulfilling the purpose for which I sent it. Mm -hmm. You know, the application for us is, that we need to hold out the word of life to as many people as possible, as often as possible. Yeah. And let God's word do the work. My challenge for every member of the Detroit church, whether you're a month old as a disciple or 24 years old as a disciple, is to sit down with someone this week and do a Bible study. Amen. Sit down with someone, open up, you lead it. Wow. Open up the scriptures. And let God's work do its thing. Yeah. He says, 
it will fulfill the purpose for which I sent it. You just need to be the vessel right. that holds out the word of God. Amen. You know, it says here in Hebrews 4 that the word of God is a, it's like a sword, a double-edged sword. You think about the power of a sword. A sword can both cut, but a sword can also be for protection. Yeah. A sword can also bring healing in the form of a scalpel and cutting something out. <laughs> in Jeremiah 23, 29, just write this down. The Bible says, is not my word like fire and like a hammer that breaks a rock into pieces? Oh, come on, bro. I love that scripture about God's word. He says, my, my, the word of God, my word is it's like a fire. It's like a hammer. You think about a fire. It can burn. It can be painful. A hammer can smash and obliterate something, but also a fire can save your life. A fire can provide light and warmth. A hammer can be used to build. God knows what you need at the right time. Sometimes it's a hammer. He wants to obliterate something and smash an idol in our lives. And it hurts. But sometimes God wants to the word so that he'll show you and teach you how to build your life yeah. with his word. So the question is, are you holding to the word yourself? Mm -hmm. And are you holding out the word life to others? You know, this is the very first Bible I ever got after I became a Christian. Wow. Wow. Almost 25 years ago. My very first Bible. And, uh, you know, it's, it's beat up. <laughs> this thing, it's literally, it's I, mean, it's it's apart. I still got it though. This thing's literally falling apart. Yeah. And that's, that is so good. But you go through it. I mean, there's barely a page that's not marked up in this Bible. Wow. I, I was so engrossed in the Word of God as a young Christian. That's why I believe I grew so much. And it's why I'm still faithful to this day. It's because I, I, I got into my Bible and I wanted to know this. I wanted to walk with God. I'd get up in the morning and it was as if the Bible was just vibrating, waiting for me to pick it up. It's like, read me. And I get up each and every day and I just get into my Bible and I loved reading my Bible. You know, I heard it said once that a Bible that's falling apart usually belongs to someone that's not. Yeah. <laughs> It's the reason I'm still here today, 24 years later, because I never stopped holding to the word, holding out the word of life to others. You know, when you hold out the word of life to others, don't worry how people respond. Don't base your effectiveness or your worth on how people respond. You just keep preaching God's word. You just keep holding out the word of life. Let God work on the heart. In Acts chapter 24, we're not going to turn there, but Paul is in jail again, and he's preaching to the Roman official Felix and his wife, Drusilla, which, by the way, Felix had seduced her. She was a Jew. He was a pagan. Got her to divorce and leave her husband and marry him. So Paul, you know, takes this opportunity to preach to them. Felix invites Paul to come preach, and here's what he says in verse 24. It says, Felix sent for Paul, and he listened to Paul as Paul spoke about faith in Jesus. As Paul continued to talk about righteousness, self-control, and the judgment to come, Felix was afraid. He said, that's enough for now. You can leave. <laughs> when I find it convenient, I'll send for you. So Paul, you know, I don't know, honestly, I don't even know if Paul knew that Felix had seduced this woman, got her to leave her, her wife and married. I don't know if Paul knew any of that, but Paul was preaching what God put on his heart. And it was hitting Felix. Paul just happened to preach about self-control, that there is a hell and judgment to come. And it says that Festus or, or, or Felix was starting to grow uncomfortable. Mm. <laughs> yeah, right. He's like, you know, I like the first part of your lesson. <laughs> right now, I'm experiencing the hammer. 
And he starts to get convicted. Mm. Oh. And it says he rejected it. Wow. Oh. It says he's like, that's enough. Stop. Pop. Stop. Stop. No more. I'll call for you when it's convenient. You know, men, they do not reject the Bible because it contradicts itself, but because it contradicts them. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> that's what Felix needed to hear. God knew it. Yeah. He rejected it, and in that, he rejected God. It fulfilled its purpose because God convicted him. Wow. God knows exactly what you need to hear at just the right time. You know, God can change someone's life. Let's look at another scripture here in Acts chapter 8 as we bring it to a close. People know what you need to hear at just the right time. Felix, he rejected it. This other guy we're going to look at right now in Acts chapter 8, he responded. He accepted the message. And it changed his life forever. I'm going to read from my very first Bible. Nice. Oh. Acts chapter 8. Hopefully Acts is still in there. <laughs> <laughs> it went missing. Acts. There you go. It's there. It's there. It's, it's one of the pages falling out, but it's there. I really like the book of Acts. Okay. Acts chapter 8. Really like the story that Philip and the Ethiopian. In verse 26, it says, Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Go south to the road, the desert road, that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. So he started out, and on his way, he met an Ethiopian eunuch and an important official in charge of all the treasury of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians. This man had gone to Jerusalem to worship, Jerusalem to worship, and on his way home was sitting in his chariot reading the book of Isaiah the prophet. The spirit told Philip, go to that chariot and stay near it. Then Philip ran up to the chariot, and he heard the man reading Isaiah the prophet. Do you understand what you are reading, Philip asked? How can I, he said, unless someone explains it to me. So we invited Philip to come up and sit with him. The eunuch was reading this passage of scripture. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter, and as a lamb before the shearer is silent, he did not open his mouth. In his humiliation, he was deprived of justice. Who can speak of his descendants. You know, often when I read the scripture, I wonder, the Bible's living and active, I wonder if this scripture particularly was hitting the Ethiopian eunuch in such a great way because he was a eunuch, which means that, you know, he had been castrated from a young age and his life was chosen. He was humiliated, if you will, and there would be no descendants coming from him. And he's reading the scripture and it says, in his, in his humiliation, he was deprived of justice. Who can speak of his descendants? His life was taken from the earth. His life was chosen for him. I'm sure he read the scripture and he was just like, man, that, that's me. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. That's my life. Is this scripture talking about me right now? <laughs> Who is this? And then, of course, the spirit says, hey, there's an open guy over there. Yeah. Run to that chariot. Come on, Philip, move it. And Philip listens to the Holy Spirit. He runs to the chariot and says, do you understand what you're reading? He's like, no. Can you sit in my chariot and explain it to me? He was humble. And so he explains the passage to him. He teaches him about the, Jesus Christ, the good news. Verse 34, it says, the eunuch asked Philip, tell me, please, who is the prophet talking about, himself or someone else? Then Philip began with that very passage of Scripture. And told him the good news about Jesus. As they traveled along the road, they came to some water. And the eunuch said, look, here is water. Why shouldn't I be baptized? And he gave the orders to stop the chariot. Then both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water. And Philip baptized him. And when they came up out of the water, the spirit of the Lord suddenly took Philip away. And the eunuch did not see him again. But he went on his way rejoicing. Amen. You know, Philip, a couple of things you see about Philip. Philip let God direct him. <laughs> Philip didn't make excuses. He didn't say, you know, it's pretty hot in this desert. I'm by myself. I've been walking around all day. I'm tired. This guy looks pretty rich. He's in, he's got his own security details. And you want me to go share my faith? There's no way he's going to be open. Yeah. He's not going to want to hear from this, this lonely dude in the desert who's he doesn't smell too good. He doesn't complain about his situation. He doesn't complain that he's in the desert by himself. 
He just says, you know what? I'm going to listen to the spirit. I'm going to run to the chariot. I'm going to share my faith with this guy. And I'm just going to see what God does. And he hears him and sees him reading the book of Isaiah. I can't help but think about Will's story. You know, Daniel was on campus a, a year ago before we came on this mission team on campus at IEPUI. And I believe Daniel only shared his faith with one person this day. I don't know if he's struggling. I don't know. Yeah, one, <laughs> one day. It's okay, though. He listened to the spirit when it came to Will. He looked over and he saw Will with a Bible on the edge of his desk. He says, I'm going to share my faith. The spirit told Daniel, share your faith with that guy. He shares his faith. And Will is here today. Come on, Will. Daniel was here. was in the right place at the right time. The right place may be in the middle of the day of a, in a desert. The encouragement for us all, keep preaching. Keep holding out the word of life one person at a time. That's how you're a light to the world. Albert Einstein said, and he found while studying light, he was specifically studying the speed of light. He concluded one thing, that light is moving particles, which we call photons. And that these moving particles, as they bounce in and hit one another, produces light, energy particles that are always moving as a wave. And when they stop moving, they cease to be light. When the particles stop moving, they actually become darkness. So he concluded that light is movement. So I want to call us to be the light of the world, to be a movement of light particles. He has a way, working together in unison. And I want to call us to stand out like stars in the sky as you hold out the word of life to God be all the glory. Amen.